Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning on a very special uh, Palm Sunday as we uh, begin our uh, remembrance of Holy Week and a very special week uh, in, the, in the church year, really, uh, in many ways, I would say the, the, the most important week. This is what our faith is all about. The Apostle Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians. If, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, uh, we are of all people most to be pitied. If, if there isn't the resurrection, uh, we, we, we don't have anything here as, as Christians. This is what this is all about. And we begin uh, with it this week in Palm Sunday, remembering when Jesus rode in very humbly as our king, the king that we uh, that the people then didn't want, sometimes the king that we don't want either. And Patrick's going to talk about that and how our hearts tend to make idols, but it's the king that we need. It's the king that saves our souls. And, uh, and so we, uh, in the words of Zechariah 9, we rejoice greatly today because our king comes. And we want to welcome you to our service, a welcome to our, our guests. We're glad you could be here with us too. Feel free to sign the guest book uh, in, the, in the back entry if you would like, and that's just a way for us to get to know you a little bit uh, better, too. We have uh, a number of announcements, mostly relating to this week. Uh, before I do, though, I just want to highlight a couple of uh, news items for you. Uh, the first one is that our intern has accepted a call. Uh, some of you already uh, know about that, but maybe many don't. He and Anna and the family are uh, moving west uh, in the all uh, the old settlers or something like that uh, to Salinas, California, which is a town just roughly the size of Fargo, I think, uh, just uh, south of San Francisco, San Jose area. And so we are excited for them and excited for uh, the, the the way that God has led them uh, to that. And uh, we're going to miss them. We've only got about a little over a month uh, with with Patrick and Anna and the kids here uh, with us. So uh, don't forget to uh, to thank them here in these last weeks too. Uh, for the time that they've had here, and we're not done with them yet. We've still got a couple of, couple of weeks to get our money's worth out of him or something like that. Uh, the other thing that I want to announce, too, we, we missed it last week. Uh, one of our members, Aaron Rudabush, was married last weekend, and wouldn't you know it, uh, Aaron and his new bride, Jody, are here today, too. And so uh, on behalf of the congregation, we are uh, so excited for you, and congratulations uh, for this new chapter in life and excited uh, for you that way also. Uh, all right, so this week uh, we've got a number of things going on. Most of our Wednesday activities are canceled uh, because of Holy Week. The one exception to that is confirmation. So if you're in confirmation, I want to see you here on Wednesday, but the rest of you I don't. Uh, and that's uh, about as far as that goes, or we'll take that anyway. Uh, then Thursday, uh, Monday, Thursday service at 6.30, and we're bringing back our, our drama. We had to miss that last week, or last year, excuse me. Uh, with COVID things, but we have a good socially distant way to do it this year. We're going to be reenacting the scene in Gethsemane and going through a bunch of uh, monologues from each of the disciples about what they were thinking that night before Jesus died. And so it's a very uh, special time, so come out for that on Thursday. We will be serving communion, and uh, we'll have it in our pews like we've been doing uh, for the last year with COVID. However, we are going to also offer it at the rail after the service. And so if uh, on that special Thursday night, if you would prefer to have communion at the altar rail, we are going to open that up and make that available to you after the service. And we'll give you more instructions uh, that night too. But just uh, keep that in mind if that's something you would like to do, uh, to come Thursday night to refrain from taking communion uh, during the service. And then after the service, we'll have a time for you to come forward. Hope that makes sense. Any questions, uh, let us know. Friday night, Good Friday 6.30 is our service of darkness, a very unique and impactful and meaningful service, so I invite you to come out for that. And then next Sunday, uh, take note of our schedule, uh, two services. The first one is at 7.30, and it's a sunrise service, and I was telling the people this morning, I think sunrise actually is right about 7.30 these days, and so, uh, and so that'll be kind of neat too. And then we'll be serving breakfast down in the fellowship hall from, from 8.30 to 9.30, so come anytime in that hour for breakfast, and then we'll have our second service at 10 a.m. So uh, church next week is at 7.30 and 10 with breakfast in between. A uh, couple other things real quick. Uh, just uh, th remember, if you I have not looked at our church directory, uh, we have a co paper copy of it spread out on the table in the, in the hallway. And uh, take a look at that to make sure your uh, contact information is up to date as we put out the new directory here in the next couple of weeks. I think this is probably the last week, or it's going to be out maybe one more week, but, but please check that uh, if you remember before, uh, before, we are, uh, before you leave here today. Uh, one more thing then, too. We have a special guest with us from uh, our AFLC headquarters, 
Pastor Jason Holt is the director of AFLC Youth Ministries, and I'll call on him uh, to share at this time. Good morning. My name is Jason Holt, and I do serve as the National Youth Director. I've served in this role for 14 years. I've been a pastor in our AFLC family since 1999. AFLC Youth Ministries exists to win teens to Jesus Christ, to build them up in the Word of God and the love of God, to equip them to live out their faith and share their faith uh, with others, and to multiply maturing teen disciples of Jesus Christ. Win, build, equip, multiply. That is what our AFLC family has asked youth ministries to focus on. And so each of those four emphases work themselves out in events and in different ways that we can come alongside the local congregation. When it comes to win, that's one of the biggest things that we're known for, the fly convention. Uh, this summer would have been uh, summer for fly convention, but as we got into 2021 and understanding some of the COVID dynamics, uh, the fly committee postponed to uh, 2023 for that. At the time of the postponement, uh, according to Colorado state and, and uh, county guidelines, we were told we could have a total of 100 people for fly. Uh, so knowing that we normally see close to 2,000, we decided that was not going to work out. Uh, as we did, the fly committee uh, turned and pivoted to look to an opportunity. So fly one night live stream has been announced for Wednesday, July 7th, 7 p.m. Central, broadcast uh, across the nation. Uh, special opportunity, we have our friend a uh, friend of uh, AFLC Youth Ministries, Eric Samuel Tim, is going to be doing uh, art and communication, worship. Uh, team will be assembled for that uh, Fly One Night live stream. You can watch for that when it comes to winning. Building, we come alongside uh, local congregations, districts, or AFLC districts. The uh, last two months since Fly's postponement, I've been in contact with youth leaders and pastors and congregations across the country in all 16 districts. And I am thrilled to share with you that from my communication, everyone is responding, responding to an open summer without Fly by finding a creative way, maybe it's their local district camp, I know Fahocha here for Eastern North Dakota, but maybe it's some special efforts that haven't happened in the past that an open summer uh, provides that way. So grateful to hear how people are responding, wanting to be built up in God's word and God's love for teens. When it comes to equipping, we're concerned about that for teens and for the caring adults that work with them. For teens, we hold Fly Beyond National Youth Equipping Week, the off summer from Fly. Uh, last summer, uh, by God's grace and, and guidance, we were able to hold Fly Beyond, and we had the biggest attendance for Fly Beyond in over a decade. And, and so we're grateful for God, how God worked through that and equipping teens, apologetics, biblical studies, um, thinking about how to use their gifts in the local congregation. But when it comes to equipping, we also turn and look at those who work with teens. Uh, in January, we had 56 youth leaders from across the country come together for a youth worker weekend uh, retreat at the Association Retreat Center, and was able to bring in Walt Mueller, uh, the president of the Center for Parent and Youth Understanding via live stream, uh, to think through anxiety and, and coming through the pandemic, coming through this season and, and all of the reports among adolescents in America is an increasing rise of anxiety. So we, we prayed, we looked biblically and thought through how in the local congregation we can be active in addressing that. When it comes to multiply, we have ways to do that. Uh, a number of years ago, we launched the apprenticeship program, which walks alongside growing youth leaders in their congregational context for a 12-month period with weekly components of mentoring from uh, a veteran youth leader with uh, a growing youth leader. Uh, we also have monthly uh, email that we send out, the YM update. We have a weekly text blast that goes uh, to youth leaders and those interested in what's going on with AFLC Youth Ministries. And then last year, we were able to launch our first branded app, uh, AFLC 
uh, youth. Uh, if you search across whatever platform that you get your app from, uh, we've had over 300 downloads and over 1,100 video views of the content that's on there. Uh, with functions for teens and for leaders, that's one way that we want to continue to multiply. So AFLC Youth Ministry stands ready uh, to be alongside of you as a congregation. And part of that multiplying we recognize is the family, whether it's Deuteronomy 6, Psalm 78, Ephesians 4, the reality there is God's calling the family and the family of God to pass on the faith to the next generation. And so we are grateful for how God is doing that at St. Paul's and look forward to being a resource to you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we rejoice in your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, on this Palm Sunday, we know that you are the king. And Lord, going into this holy week, we know, Lord Jesus, uh, that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord, we, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 reminds us, Lord Jesus, you are our Passover lamb. So Lord, as we go into this week, Lord, we rejoice in looking to the cross for ourselves. And, and Lord, in thinking about this incredible deliverance you've given to us, that you have called each of us to pass on to the next generation. May we be faithful in that, looking to you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Jason, for uh, sharing with us. I should uh, just uh, let you know, too, that our youth committee has been working very hard uh, since the postponement of the Fly Convention this year, which is such a major event in the life of our youth group, uh, to find a, a good alternative. And they have uh, decided uh, to partner with a few other congregations in taking a trip out to uh, western Montana, uh, Glacier National Park, and having a Bible camp out there with a number of other congregations. And so uh, we are excited for them to be able to have that opportunity, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that too uh, from the youth and so forth uh, in, the, in the weeks and months to come. But, uh, but that's the plan. I think it's actually the same week uh, as the fly convention would have been. I'm kind of looking at a couple of youth committee members. I think that's right, yeah. So, uh, so I'll be praying for our youth uh, in that too and in their preparations uh, for, that, for that trip this, uh, this summer. If that's all the announcements, uh, then uh, let's, uh, let's open our service with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for your abundant goodness and mercy to us. As we reflect today on uh, your kingly nature and role in our hearts and lives, God. Uh, you are uh, just frankly the, the, the Lord of all. You are the Lord of creation. We rejoice, we, we praise you, we magnify your name for your marvelous works, and we, uh, and, and we thank you that in your, in your great and awesome power, you are also steadfastly loving and that you chose to come to this earth and to die a humble death so that you might be exalted, so that we might share, so that we might have your righteousness imputed to us and given to us freely. And so uh, we thank you for that. We love you for that today. And I pray that you would bless this time that we have together in worship now. In your name I pray. Amen. Today's call to worship comes from Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people, for like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Please stand and worship with us.
John 12, uh, verse 12 through 13 says, The next day the large crowd had come to the feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. One of the uh, things in that song that, that was mentioned there towards the end is that he is the only one that can bring eternal salvation uh, to us. And, and, and it's good for us uh, each, uh, each day, but, but as we gather on Sundays too, to, uh, to, to, to remember that indeed Christ is our only hope and that without him, uh, we are hopelessly lost. And, and it's good for us to confess uh, that, to confess our sin nature, to confess our, our sins. There's always a little brief time of silence after we do a confession of sins. And I would encourage you to make use of that time, not just today, but on a regular basis too, as things come to your mind that, uh, that, that, that you have personal uh, need of personal confession before the Lord too. So let's uh, spend this time quietly, humbly, uh, confessing our sins. You'll find the words on the screen and then, uh, and then taking, uh, taking part in that time of silence also. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God saw the state of our need and he sent his son Jesus. And in Philippians 2, uh, it talks about how Jesus came humbly. Uh, it says that, that, that Jesus, even though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Jesus took our place on the cross that day and he did so so that he might uh, shed his blood to cleanse you from your sins and to purchase your forgiveness before the almighty and holy 
God, and it says that therefore God has, also, has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and t- every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We joyfully and boldly and confidently proclaim in Jesus Christ as our Lord today because of his amazing, awesome, sufficient victory over sin, death, and the devil when he went to the cross and his victory when he rose from the grave. That's where we find our hope today and each day. And we look to him as our king, as our savior, as the Lord of the universe, the Lord of our hearts. Amen. This time I'll call on Jeremy Larson to read our scripture. The Old Testament lesson is from Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Would you please stand in reverence to God's holy word. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse, war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The epistle lesson is from Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though who though he was in in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so so that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The gospel lessons from Mark 14, 1 through 15. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him By stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, What she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought an opportunity to betray him. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a a large upper room, furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. This ends our reading for today. Let's join uh, together and confess our faith. This is what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And amen, you may be seated. I'm here to bring the children's message to you. Um, I have no props besides my finger. You guys all seem pretty smart. What are all the things that you could do with this right here? Some of you are thinking, you know, I, no, no, don't do that. What could you do with this? You could point at somebody. Yeah, you can point at something. Hey, there's a TV right there. Yeah, go ahead. You can tap on things. Has your brother or sister ever, like, kind of pushed you to, like, hey, you don't do that? I think I did that to my brothers when I was younger. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Go ahead. A, mi <laughs> a microwave? <laughs> That's so funny. I forgot about that one. Yeah. A microwave. That's great. On Palm Sunday, um, we have these palm branches here. And these palm branches were used to wave and to lay on the ground as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And what they were saying is they were saying, Jesus is number one. He's number one. He's number one. You can do that with that finger too, right? Number one, yeah. But something pretty bad happened in about five days later. You see that number one turned into a point. It turned into, Jesus, you're number one. You are the king that enters Jerusalem. That's Palm Sunday. That's why it's such an important and exciting day. Jesus shows himself as the king that enters in triumphal entry. But just five days later, that finger started pointing. On Palm Sunday, they said, Hosanna, save us, O king. But five days later, they pointed to Jesus and they said, crucify, crucify him. And our sermon today talks a little bit about that. It talks about how Jesus is king over us. But sometimes Jesus doesn't always look like we think he should. And that causes us, in our hearts anyway, to doubt him as king. So I encourage you to listen to that in our sermon today. Um, our, our hymn before the, the message is All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
Microwave. I'm still getting over that. Microwave. I forgot about it. Um, let us uh, go to God's Word in our sermon, and I would ask that you would stand out of reverence if you are able. We will be reading from Acts 17. Acts 17, verses 22 to 34. Acts 17, 22 to 34. What I'll be doing a little bit today is kind of intertwining Palm Sunday with this text. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent." because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, may your word take action in our life. May it grow us in faith. May it convict of sins. And Lord, ultimately, we pray that it would produce faith in us. Lord, we thank you for it. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever been telling someone about the gospel message of Christ? And I hope you have. It's sometimes harder to do than we think. But have you ever been doing that, sharing the gospel message, and just been struck with the foolishness of the gospel? I remember this happening several times to me. I'm talking to them, and I'm giving the basic gospel message that the Almighty God, the Creator, became a man. He came to this earth. He died for our sins. He rose again. And if you believe in him, all your sins are forgiven. From a logical standpoint, the gospel is foolishness. And have you ever thought that? Have you ever wondered that you're not alone? It's foolishness to think that God would really care about me. Do I care about ants or mosquitoes? You know, sometimes we see ourselves as so insignificant. It's foolishness to think that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. The fullness of the deity dwells within him. It's foolishness to think that God Almighty would become a servant, humbling himself to die, even death on a cross. It's foolishness to think of the dead coming alive again. If you've ever felt this way, you're not alone. Our logic tells us that these things should not be so, and we do all things in logic. We do what makes sense, and we don't do what doesn't make sense, most of the time anyway. This is part of the joy of Palm Sunday for me. We have the children come and wave palm branches, at least we normally do, just not this year. The message of the gospel is simple. Jesus is king. We welcome him. 
For children, the foolish of the gospel is nothing. Jesus is king. Enough said. And they wave their palm branches and they smile with joy at that very simple message. It is hard as adults not to let logic rule the day, isn't it? To accept the simple message of the gospel surely takes faith. Because logically, it doesn't make sense. This seems to be the case on the original Palm Sunday as we, as we start to talk about Holy Week. Jesus rode into Jerusalem in a triumphal entry. The only problem was, it really wasn't that triumphal. This was no Super Bowl parade with tons of floats. This was no Aladdin scene, King Ali, mighty is he, Ali Ababwa, riding on an elephant. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Matthew 21, 9 through 11, talks about this a little bit. It talks about his triumphal entry. It says, And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from the Nazareth, from Nazareth of Galilee. The people were welcoming Jesus because of what Jesus had done. It was a pretty big ordeal. There were people hailing him as king, laying their palm branches and robes down. They had seen the wonderful miracles that Jesus had done. And a couple days before this, he had actually raised Lazarus to life. And maybe some of those who were there had actually seen Lazarus and known Lazarus and knew he died and saw him again. Surely this man is the Son of God. But from Palm Sunday to Good Friday, everything changed. The human mind must have started to logically think about everything, must have started to doubt. The Messiah that they were expecting was a different Messiah than what they welcomed into Jerusalem. In Matthew 21.10, that great theological question is asked really deep, who is this? People see Jesus and they say, who is this? I had a sermon a couple weeks ago about that idea, how this is the most important question you could ask in life. And as Matthew 21.10 asks the question, who is this? We see Paul in Acts 17 answering the question of who is this? And as we see Acts 17 we see that Paul answers it with three different things. And these will be kind of the main points we're going off today. Says that this is not an unknown God, but it is God revealed through Jesus Christ, and he is the creator God. He is the God that is near, and he is the God that is judge. As we talk about God being the creator creator God, we look at verses 24. And kind of go all the way to 29 is is kind of where I'll end up here. And I'm just going to highlight a couple things that Paul says. This is God. If you look further up, you'll see that Paul was talking about Jesus and his resurrection. And then Paul makes the transition because they're one and the same to God. God is the creator. Verse 24, God made the world and everything in it. God is the Lord of heaven and earth. God does not live in temples made by man. God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. God gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. He made from one man every nation. And then going down to verse 29, it says, We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. You see, this is the problem that gets us from Palm Sunday to Good Friday and the drastic change that has taken place. The people welcomed in Jesus as they thought him to be. 
But over the course of the five days, Jesus didn't match what they thought he should be. It is when we create an image of God that is not biblical that we actually start to carve our own image of him in gold and silver and stone, so to speak. And in this, we stray from true worship of the king that came. America has many preconceived notions of who God is. God is a harsh judge. Brian Chappell talks about this. He says, uh, some consider God to be like an angry ogre in the sky, waiting for you to, to disobey God's law so that he can hammer you with the law and convict you. Some say that God doesn't love me. Some ask, how can there be a God when bad things happen? Some say that Jesus is just a good story, good moral lessons. And if you ask people how they will get to heaven, I guarantee you're going to get a lot of different answers. I actually did this in Minneapolis. I went door to door and asked the question, you know, if you are at the gate of heaven and are, are the, you're asked, how will you get in to heaven? Almost resoundingly, it was good works. I'm a good person. God is good. He should, surely wouldn't send me to hell. The biblical illiteracy of our generation has carved out an image of God that just isn't true. And in doing so, we are flirting with being a very religious people like is happening here in Athens that is going from God is number one to crucify. We're flirting with it as a culture. Today is Palm Sunday, and in five days, the people went from that very saying, Hosanna, save us, to crucify, save yourself. The people had made God into what they thought they should be. As a fallen humanity, it will always be a temptation for the created to define the creator. God defines himself. Unless we are intentional to seek who God is through the means by which he reveals himself, mainly the written word and the incarnate word, Jesus Christ, then we will fall into the temptation for us as a created to define God the creator. The Jews must have been terribly disappointed in the God that came. They thought with all those miracles that surely this is Jesus who will overthrow the Roman Empire. They had been under bondage to different empires for so long. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians, and now the Romans. And they were longing for liberation. Here he is, our God. Our Messiah, He, with all the power and miraculous signs and wonders, He will free us. They expected results now. Hosanna literally means, save us now. Save us now, Lord. Not in the future, not for eternity. Take and remove the burden we have now. Jesus didn't fit their image, how they viewed the coming Messiah, so ultimately, they got rid of him. What are your expectations of God? What are your expectations of who Jesus is? From a book called Pastoral Care Under the Cross by a guy named Richard Ayer, highly recommended by the way, really talks about dealing with suffering. He talks about how people long for something that's called theology of glory. And he explains it this way, which is a pretty common thing to, to happen. He says, he tells a story about a woman who was dying of cancer. The, the church set up a prayer time. The women set up a prayer ministry that they were going to pray for this woman 24-7 for an extended period of time until it needed to stop. 
And they fully thought that because God is the healer God, that he would show up and he would heal that lady. But unfortunately, God didn't, and she died. They were crying out, Hosanna, save her. But when he didn't, they were left to doubt who God is. And how easily it could have turned into crucify him in their hearts to say, you are not the Messiah that I thought you were, and to get rid of him. These women expected God to do something, to act in a certain way, and when he didn't show up, they didn't know what to do. This kind of theology is called the theology of glory, and it can very easily lead from save us to save yourself, Lord, from Hosanna to crucify. See, the theology of glory is appealing. Paul here is talking about how Jesus and God are the creator God. All things that have come to be are in him. He is the God that parted the Red Sea. He is the Messiah who raised Lazarus from the dead. He has glory. Richard Eyre offers a different option to focus on, though. See, the theology of glory places God and puts him and tells him how he should use his glory rather than trusting him to use it for his glory. Pastor Richard Eyre says, instead of the theology of glory, let us look to the theology of the cross. Theology of cross is viewing everything through what God has already accomplished on the cross. Do you wonder if God loves you? Look at the cross. Do you wonder how valuable you are? Look at the cross. Do you wonder who God is in the midst of suffering? You look at the cross. And it is through the cross that we are able to see a God in the midst of suffering pour out his love for you. And this cross is a part of how God shows himself to be near. That's our second point. God has revealed himself. And as he reveals himself, he becomes near to us. He is no longer an abstract thought that is unknown, but a God in which we can know. He is a known God. He revealed himself on Palm Sunday as a humble servant king. He doesn't ride into Jerusalem on a warrior's horse, but on a donkey of peace. He rides in to proclaim peace to all those who need it, which is everyone. He declares that he is the one that is going to Jerusalem to take on the wrath of God so that we can have peace. God is near because he has become a man. He has become flesh like us. He has become the true and better Adam that through one man, all mankind might be offered redemption. That's Romans 5. God is near because he has endured suffering. He has been tempted as we are tempted and is now the perfect mediator between God and man. And his message is reconciliation. God is near because he has been resurrected. His resurrection gives us the hope that we need. Romans 6 tells us that how near we are to him. We are unified to Christ's work of death and resurrection in baptism. It says, we have been united with him in a death like his. We shall surely be united with him in a resurrection like his. Talk about a near God, unified to him in his work. God is near because the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us. We are now the very dwelling place of God. God is near because he has revealed himself through his word. He tells us who he is, and he offers us to believe in faith. The God, this is how it's actually said in Acts 17, the one true God is not an unknown God. 
He gives us His name, I am. He gives us His word and His promises. He gives us His Son. He gives us eyewitness testimonies, the apostles. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us His body and blood to partake in. The one true God that the Athenians declare to be unknown, Paul declares as the known God. And we know God because He has made Himself known. Much like Paul to the Athenians, Paul meets them where they are. He brings their poets to them. He talks about the gods that they worship. God relates to us. He comes to us in a way that we can know and understand Him. He gives us His word in our own language. He takes on our flesh and He dwells within our body. We also hear from Paul that God is judge. Verse 30 in our Acts 17 says, The time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God has overlooked times of ignorance, but now he commands everywhere, everyone everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world. God will not overlook your ignorance. Repent. God is coming to judge the world. Repent. We cannot claim that we do not know God. We cannot claim ignorance anymore. Look at creation and see the God, the Creator. Look at Christ and see God's love for you. Read the Word and let God reveal Himself to you. Seek the scriptures like the Bereans, just a couple verses before this text. Seek the Lord. He is not far from you. Seek him while he is found. God has appointed a man, Jesus, to judge the world. See, when Jesus came on Palm Sunday, he was riding on a donkey. But Revelation 19.11 says that one day he's coming on a white horse. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True and in righteousness he judges and makes war. He's coming to judge. And this judgment invokes fear into us. And rightfully it should. We are all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. But then Paul tells us in our text that he has also given us assurance by raising him from the dead. Through Christ's resurrection, we have the assurance that he, Jesus Christ, is God. And if he is God, that means we have full assurance that all that he said and did is true. Repent. Believe. You have full assurance that when he comes again, you will be saved from the destruction that you deserved. This is the simple gospel message. Jesus has been made visible. He has made known the invisible God. He is truly God. He is truly King. And he truly will come to judge the wicked. But he will deliver all those who believe in him as their Lord and Savior. If you fear the judgment of God, repent. He calls for all people everywhere to do this. And if you look forward to the coming judgment, then praise God for the assurance that he gives in his work. And his word. 
Palm Sunday brings back all sorts of childhood memories for me. When I see the palm branches and hear the shouts of Hosanna, it reminds me of the simple gospel message. Jesus is King. We praise him for what he has done, and we praise him for our future hope and glory. If anyone here has not repented of their sins, God tells you today in Acts 17, he will no longer overlook ignorance. Today is your day to to cry out to him, Hosanna, save me. And as you do, he will show you that he already has. This is the work of the cross. This is what Jesus was riding on the donkey of peace to proclaim. It is that he would die on the cross so that peace could be brought to you and God. This is the theology of the cross. As we look to the cross for the salvation we desire, he shows us that our salvation is already won. The victory that we need has already been purchased and that the eternal peace we so long and hope for is already assured. Amen. Our closing hymn is all hail the power of Jesus' name. in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, let that be our everlasting song, 
that you are king, you are Lord of all. Lord, we know that it is through the cross and through knowing you that we see how beautiful you are. We thank you for revealing yourself to us in so many ways so that we may know you, Lord. It is your desire that we all be saved. Lord, that we would dwell again with you. Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness to us. Lord, I do thank you as well that you hear our prayers. Pray that you hear us as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Arise and receive the benediction coming from Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.